Before the break, we ended with the First Great Awakening, which the parallel movement in England was the Evangelical Revival. We talked about some of the most prominent names, both in England and in New England, associated with that revival work. John and Charles Wesley in England. John Wesley regarded as the father of... Well, the father of Methodism, I was going to say Arminian Methodism, but the reality is that the Arminian Methodist movement is by far the largest percentage of Methodism worldwide. So John Wesley, the father of Methodism, Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer who wrote over 6,000 hymns, and then of course George Whitfield, the wonderful, eloquent expositor and evangelist of both the evangelical revival in England and the Great Awakening in New England, who made a total of 13 transatlantic voyages, seven trips to the American colonies where he preached and taught and was, by pretty much all historical accounts, the most recognizable figure in the American colonies before George Washington, simply because he was so well known for his oratory. Amazing ability to preach, preaching to tens of thousands of people without modern amplification, and preaching in such a way that people were getting saved, and getting saved in mass, and that's why we talk about this period of time as a revival. So we have the evangelical revival in England, the Great Awakening, that parallel movement in New England. We talked primarily and specifically about Jonathan Edwards, considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, theological mind that America has ever produced, and one who was directly involved in that great revival in New England in the early 1740s, late 1730s, what we call the First Great Awakening. Today we're going to talk about the Second Great Awakening, and uh, in order to do this, we're largely going to follow Ian Murray's helpful book called Revival and Revivalism. It's a long book, 455 pages, but it's worth the read. It's one of the best books dealing with this part of American church history, revival and revivalism. And even the title is very instructive for us as we think about the Second Great Awakening. Coming into the Second Great Awakening, out of the First Great Awakening, the only type of conversions and reformation that the church knew of was true revival, revival in the purest sense. And what I mean by that is it was the preaching of the truth of God's word, the preaching of the gospel, the exposition of evangelistic texts and direct calls for sinners to repent and believe. It was the biblical gospel being preached that resulted in people being saved. And as people were saved by the work and power of the Holy Spirit, who took his word and used it to convict the hearts of sinners, as people were being saved individually, when that happened on a manifold scale, people referred to that as a time or a season of revival or a season of awakening. So it was a spiritual awakening a spiritual regeneration that took place. Revival was very much something that was not orchestrated, it was not manipulated, it was not pre-planned. It was something that was unexpected. John 3, when Jesus explains to Nicodemus how the Holy Spirit works, he says it's like the wind. The wind blows wherever the wind wants to blow and no one can control it. It's my paraphrase, obviously. That's the same way that the Holy Spirit works when it comes to conversion and salvation. The power of the Spirit is something that we cannot control. We are simply instruments and uh, heralds of the true gospel. And as we preach the gospel, as we sow the seed, so to speak, then God does the work in those whom he has chosen. And that work is one which cannot be manipulated. It cannot be coerced. Faith cannot be forced. That's revival. Revival is God's work, and the human instrument simply is a faithful messenger, but the power and the initiative is God 
who works through his spirit according to his own sovereign providence. All right, that's what we've seen in the Reformation, right? The Reformation is the word of God bursting forth into 16th century Europe and people getting saved. And then the Great Awakening, the Evangelical Revival of the 18th century, is the Word of God being preached. In this case, it's being preached outside where tens of thousands of people can gather, but it's the Word of God being preached, the biblical gospel being explained and exclaimed. And the result is people are getting saved. But this is unexpected. It's not manipulated or coerced. All of that begins to shift in the Second Great Awakening. So the Second Great Awakening begins, much like the First Great Awakening, as an unexpected move of the Holy Spirit on the hearts of hundreds and thousands of people. But by the time we get to the end of the Second Great Awakening, we have some people, some evangelists, some Christian ministers, who have begun to consider ways in which perhaps human beings might be able to orchestrate revival. Ways in which we might be able to plan revival, to expect revival. I would say ways in which we would be able to manipulate or force or or coerce revival such that we could actually create an atmosphere in which quote-unquote revival is more likely to take place. These new thoughts, these new perspectives, these new measures, as they come to be called, are what Ian Murray labels revivalism. Okay, so revivalism is the mechanism of revival in which human beings attempt to manipulate revival. Revival itself is just an unmanipulated, unplanned work of the Holy Spirit. So we're shifting now from revival as this unexpected work of God to revivalism such that after the Second Great Awakening is over, we're going to start to have evangelists who hold revivals. And these revivals no longer refer to lots of people getting saved over time, but rather refer to specific meetings that you could put on a calendar. And churches start to say, you know, next May we are going to have revival. And from Thursday through Sunday, we are going to have revival. And revival becomes something we put on the calendar and plan for because we can now create and coerce and manipulate revival such that we are actually able to make it happen. Uh, this, is a, this is a negative shift in the history of the church, but it explains much of what goes on even in contemporary American evangelical circles today. And it largely has to do with a shift even in the way in which evangelists think about the gospel and think about conversion, because obviously if revival is something that you and I can create, then that means it's no longer a supernatural, miraculous work of God. It has to be something else. It has to be something human. And as we're going to see, we have a shift in thinking now from really personal revival and regeneration and conversion as this long process in which a person comes out the other side transformed by a work of the Holy Spirit to something that's nothing more than a momentary decision, a change of a change of decision, I suppose, where a person in a moment of emotional ecstasy or in a moment of great fear makes a decision, prays a prayer, signs a card, walks an aisle, comes down to the mourner's bench or whatever the mechanism might be, and we're going to start counting those decisions as the way in which we measure revival. So all of this takes place during the Second Great Awakening. This is an important shift, and it's a uh, I think very instructive for the way in which we think about contemporary evangelicalism today. All right, so we're going to work our way through these notes just a little bit today. And uh, again, this is largely drawn from Ian Murray's book, Revival and Revivalism. So a true work of God versus a man-made, coerced, orchestrated, manipulated form of forcing people to make decisions. And uh, evangelists, after this time, uh, start to think of themselves, or start to act, I suppose would be a better way of saying this, start to act more like, you know, more like salespeople. 
Um, I don't know if you've ever, this is really a random tangent, but I don't know if you've ever sat in on one of those timeshare presentations. Uh, perhaps you have. Um, you, you're always promised some great prize if you go and sit in on a timeshare presentation. I've done it only once. I, I don't think I will ever do it again. But uh, they take you into this room and, um, you know, they've got these um, great music playing and they've got, uh, kind of, you know, kind of soft music playing and then they've got like incense candles burning uh, this, you know, and then they've, they've got these salespeople trying to make you feel comfortable and, uh, and, and then they pretty much <clears throat> keep pressing and pressing and pressing trying to get you to sign up for a timeshare. That's what evangelism becomes after the Second Great Awakening. It becomes this manipulative sales pitch rather than just preaching the gospel and letting God do his work. So let's watch that transition take place as we go through these notes. I'm not exactly sure where the timeshare thing came from. I, I did not buy a timeshare in case you're wondering how that went. I escaped with my life and my wallet. Uh, a couple differences between the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening is a smaller, uh, even though it's the first, it's a smaller revival. It, it concentrates regionally just on New England and primarily just with the Puritans. So. The Puritan congregations would be both the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians. And kind of as we move forward from the First Great Awakening, we're going to refer to the Puritan movement by the label Presbyterianism because that really is what it becomes when we speak of the denominational affiliation of that Puritan kind of, um, that Puritan legacy as it passes down into the later generations of American history. So Ian Murray explains to us the difference between the first and the second great awakenings here. He says, while its name rightly puts the second great awakening in succession to the first, it fails to alert us to the measure in which they differed. First, for one thing, there was a remarkable difference in time scale. The duration of the first great awakening extended through three to five years at most. And so we would date it from 1738 or 39 up until 1741. But the duration of the second was not less than a quarter of a century. And in the opinion of most, several years longer, probably from 1798 or so, maybe 1800, all the way up until the 1820s is the second great awakening. So a significant period of time. Second, the second was of a far greater geographical extent and reached far more people. Abel Stevens, the Methodist historian, believed that at the beginning of the 19th century, religious interest was universal, if not simultaneous, from Maine to Tennessee and from Georgia to Canada. So whereas the first Great Awakening had concentrated just in New England, the second Great Awakening encompassed the entirety of the American colonies. Third, in the 1740s, few congregations outside of the Presbyterian and congregational bodies were stirred into new life, even though Whitfield was an Anglican Methodist. But in the early 1800s, in addition to two, these two denominations, Baptists, Methodists, and others, including the Episcopal Church, that's the Anglican Church, were all affected. So it encompasses more denominations than just the Puritan denominations. So it's longer than the First Great Awakening, it's broader in its geographical extent, and it is also broader in the fact that it encompasses really all of the Protestant denominations that were active in the American colonies at that time. Leading up to the Awakening, we start with Princeton University. Of course, it wasn't called Princeton University at that time. It was just the College of New Jersey. But what would eventually become Princeton University and what I will refer to anachronistically as Princeton University, simply because that's easier to have as a point of reference than always saying the new College of New Jersey every time we talk about Princeton. 
Princeton University was established by the New Light Presbyterians, and we talked about that group before the break. The New Light Presbyterians, along with the New School Congregationalists, these were those Puritans who were in favor and supportive of the First Great Awakening. You remember in the First Great Awakening, there were some emotional responses to the preaching, and those emotional responses were of, of enough substance that some of the older Puritans in particular didn't, didn't approve of those emotional reactions that people in the congregation had to that First Great Awakening preaching. And so those old light Presbyterians, they, they rejected the First Great Awakening and said that it was not a legitimate revival. Uh, Yale and Harvard more or less trended towards those old light Presbyterians, those old school Congregationalists. And so a new college was started in New Jersey by these new light Presbyterians. These are the ones who are in favor of what was happening in the revival of the first Great Awakening. So it's interesting to see the link from the First Great Awakening and those who were the supporters of it, Whitfield, Edwards, of course, was a president of this College of New Jersey for just a short while before he died. These supporters of the First Great Awakening start a school, what becomes Princeton. And it is out of Princeton that we will have the Second Great Awakening begin. And so there is a direct connection between the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening, such that in some sense, the Second Great Awakening is almost an extension and an outgrowth of the evangelistic fervor and zeal and preaching of the First Great Awakening. Princeton was started to provide Christian education for uh, all, I mean, all of these schools, of course, were started to provide Christian education. Uh, but its education was not limited just to training pastors. In the first 80 years, the College of New Jersey had 2,500 graduates, one fifth of whom became pastors and ministers. When John Witherspoon, a name that maybe is familiar to you because John Witherspoon was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, John Witherspoon, a Scottish minister, became the president of Princeton in 1768, and he remained the president there for 25 or so years until 1794. And it was during his presidency that there was a revival on the campus of Princeton itself. So here, even at this college campus, we have a revival. One of the students who was converted during this time period was a man named John McMillan. John McMillan would become one of the leaders of the Presbyterian movement on the western frontiers of Pennsylvania. So in Jonathan Edwards' days, the western frontiers was western Massachusetts. Here we are about 50 years later, and we have the western frontiers in western Pennsylvania. And so we're slowly moving west as we progress in American church history. Macmillan becomes known as the Apostle of the West because of his work there. Committed to education, he starts a academy called Pittsburgh Academy. Today it's called Pittsburgh University. And he trains over 100 other ministers and preaches over 6,000 sermons during his lifetime. Now listen to his conversion story. Regarding his conversion, Macmillan writes this, I never saw that I was a lost, undone sinner, exposed to the wrath of a justly offended God and could do nothing for my own relief. This is his pre-conversion state. In this situation, I continued until I entered college at Princeton in the spring of 1770. I had not long been there until a revival of religion took place among the students, and I believe at one time there were not more than two or three, but were what were under serious impressions. It's a way of referring to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he means by impressions. On a day which had been set apart by a number of the students to be observed as a day of fasting and prayer, while the others were at dinner, I retired into my study. And while trying to pray, I got some discoveries of divine things which I had never had before. 
I saw that the divine law was not only holy, just, and spiritual, but that it was good also, and that uniformity to it would make me happy. I felt no disposition to quarrel with the law, but with myself, because I was not conformed to it. I felt that it was now easy to submit to the gospel plan of salvation and felt a serenity of mind to which I had hitherto been a stranger and was followed by a delight in contemplating God's glorious perfections in all his works. I thought I could see God in everything around me. So here we have Macmillan, John Macmillan, this student there at Princeton under the presidency of John Witherspoon, who was one of the successors to Jonathan Edwards in terms of being a president of Princeton. And he's explaining that part of this revival was that he discovered really the truth. He'd always known, of course, the, the truth of God's word in a academic sense, but he discovered that truth in a personal sense and he experienced regeneration. And we, we have even some of the language of Edwards in his... In his um, testimony here where he talks about the delight that he saw in serving Christ and in following God's law. Macmillan then is converted, he is saved, and he along with some other Princeton graduates, Thaddeus Dodd, James Power, and a guy named Joseph Smith who is not the Joseph Smith who we'll talk about later when we talk about Mormonism. Uh, these men travel west and establish the Presbyterian Church west in uh, western Pennsylvania. There, as they're preaching on the frontiers, they begin to see revival among the American pioneers. And so we're starting to have revival breaking out now on the western frontiers. Macmillan describes these revivals. <clears throat> he talks about a remarkable season of the work of the Spirit, the outpouring of the Spirit that began in Thanksgiving of 1781, and how he says many, this is in the middle of this quote, many were pricked to the heart with deep convictions, and a good number became subjects of renewing grace. And he's talking then about, he uses the word sacramental, but what he's really talking about is the ordinance of communion that they were observing there as part of their ministering work in western Pennsylvania. So we're seeing now the first great awakening results in the founding of this school. There's a revival on the campus of Princeton. Some of those who were saved under that revival, they go and with that same evangelistic fervor, they begin ministering on the frontiers of western Pennsylvania and we're having the gospel preached and people are responding to it and the work of the Holy Spirit is such that people are getting saved. In other denominations... Baptists and Methodists, and, and really from this point on, we're going to primarily talk about Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists, because they become the three primary American denominations from the Second Great Awakening on. Certainly we still have Episcopalianism, which is the American form of Anglicanism. Uh, we also have, of course, the Roman Catholic Church, which I don't regard as a true denomination, but as something which is also uh, continuing to grow here in America during this time period. But the three main denominations that we'll discuss are the Baptists, the Methodists, and the Presbyterians. The First Great Awakening not only charged up the Presbyterians, in particular the New Light Presbyterians, it also charged up the Baptists. And George Whitfield's preaching in particular becomes a model now for preaching during the Second Great Awakening preaching outside, preaching in an evangelistic manner. And so we have Baptist preachers who are charged by the Great Awakening, like Daniel Marshall, Samuel Harris, and David Thomas. And then during the same time period, Methodist preachers begin having great success in the colonies, especially in the South. And, and during the 19th century, Methodism will become America's fastest growing denomination. And this is the period of time in which you have those great circuit riding preachers who are going and logging 
hundreds of thousands of miles on horseback as they ride from settlement to settlement to settlement, preaching to whomever will listen. Part of this is due to the fact that as Americans are expanding westward, there really is no infrastructure for churches and uh, no way even for some of these pioneers to go to a church on a regular basis because there's no church near where they live. And so these circuit riding preachers, outdoor preaching, this type of outdoor evangelism and meetings becomes very, very popular because it's the only access point that many of these people have to any sort of organized church as the church infrastructure is trying to catch up with the American westward expansion. So though the preachers, I have this final bullet point here, though the preachers of the Great Awakening had all been Calvinistic, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Gilbert Tennant, and others, the Methodists, the Arminian Methodists, under the influence of John Wesley, uh, they began to repudiate Calvinism as a dangerous error. And uh, in fact, we'll see that as we talk about some of these Methodist preachers on the frontiers. Uh, there was one guy in particular, he comes a little bit later, but a guy named Peter Cartwright, who was a famous Methodist preacher at some of the Methodist camp meetings that took place on the frontiers. Peter Cartwright had a reputation for being a real tough guy to the point where if people were, if people were interrupting and being noisy and disruptive uh, during his preaching, he would sometimes take off his coat, leave the pulpit, go down and thrash somebody in the audience, and then get back up and keep <laughs> preaching. Uh, Peter Cartwright had a famous sermon uh, in which he compared John Calvin to the devil. And uh, so that was the kind of anti-Calvinist preaching that was going on in some of these circles during this time period. But in any case, we'll talk more about that as uh, we move forward. Uh, in spite of these revivals in the mid-1700s, we have the Great Awakening in the 1730s and 40s. We have George Whitfield still preaching in the colonies all the way up until his death in the early 1770s. Uh, we have, of course, the influence and legacy of men like Jonathan Edwards. But in spite of all of that, in spite of the founding of what becomes Princeton University and even on-campus revivals there at Princeton, the mid to late 1700s is a time of spiritual decline and uncertainty in the American colonies. Part of that is due to the American Revolution in 1776. So it's hard to have a time of national revival while you're also having a time of national rebellion against England. And so the Revolutionary War kind of interrupts the spiritual revival that was taking place in the 1700s. As we come to the end of the Revolutionary War then, into the late 1790s and early 1800s, Revival again comes to the American colonies, and this is what we refer to then as the Second Great Awakening. And in some ways, the Second Great Awakening even lingers all the way until the Civil War, when again that revival period is broken by a period of war and of armed conflict here in the United States. So we have a, a, a falling off period, a period of what Ian Murray calls dark times and low conditions, something that uh, it came to characterize the American spiritual climate of the mid to late 1700s. All right, this I've already talked about a little bit, but I want to just reiterate this point. It is important to draw attention to the fact that the revival the Second Great Awakening at its beginning, just like the First Great Awakening, had been unexpected. It had not been planned for or manipulated. It was viewed as a great and unexpected work of the Holy Spirit, attributed on the human level only to prayer and to the preaching of the Word. So Ian Murray says this, What special means were used to promote these revivals? The answer is that there were none. The facts are indisputable. A considerable body of men for a long period before the Second Great Awakening preached the same message as they did during the revival, 
but with vastly different consequences. The same men, the same actions, performed with the same abilities, yet the results were so amazingly different. The conclusion has to be drawn that the change in the churches after 1798 and 1800 cannot be explained in terms of the means used. Nothing was clearer to those who saw the events than that God was sovereignly pleased to bless human instrumentality in such a way that the success could be attributed to him alone. Murray's point is that in the 1700s, let's start at the 1720s, people are preaching the gospel. Then in the 1730s, people are preaching the gospel. In the 1740s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, people are preaching the gospel. In the 1790s, early 1800s, people are preaching the gospel. Nothing changes in the way people are preaching the gospel. They're just presenting the truth. And yet, for some reason, in God's sovereign providence, he chose to bless that gospel preaching in a particular and remarkable way in the 1730s and 40s, the first great awakening, and in the 1790s and early 1800s, the second great awakening, than he did in those other decades where people were doing exactly the same thing. Murray's point is the the call and the requirement of the preacher is simply to be faithful to the message and you let God worry about how and when he's going to bless your faithfulness in terms of numerical response. So you don't try and manipulate numerical response. You simply preach the truth and you're faithful in the way that you preach the truth. And sometimes God blesses that numerically and sometimes he doesn't. But the standard by which you determine and measure your success in ministry is not by the numbers of responses. It is simply by the faithfulness that you have in preaching the truth of the message. That's Murray's point. And Murray's saying, look, in the Reformation, people were just preaching the truth. And God saw fit to respond in a particular way. In the First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, same thing was true. But all of that is about to transition and shift in the way that people think about the preaching of the gospel. Uh, The revival in the early 1800s, the Second Great Awakening, it resulted in the founding of numerous evangelistic and evangelical organizations. So we have the American Board of Foreign Missions formed in 1810, the American Bible Society formed in 1816, the American Tract Society formed in 1825, We have seminaries started. Princeton Theological Seminary is started in 1812. It's a distinct organization and institution from Princeton University. Um, Though the two are geographically close and did partner in certain activities early on. In the early 1800s, revival also comes to the wilderness of the West. And so with John McMillan, who was that apostle to the West there in western Pennsylvania, one of his students is a man named James McGreedy, a good Scottish Presbyterian name. James McGreedy, he becomes an evangelist in Kentucky. And um, some people actually date the beginning of the Second Great Awakening from the Uh, camp meetings that James McGreedy begins to hold in Kentucky as a way to reach these pioneers who are pushing west on the frontiers of America in the early 1800s. Back in Scotland, the Scottish Presbyterians would sometimes hold outdoor communion meetings where multiple congregations would come together outside and celebrate communion together. James McGreedy took that model and he instituted it in Kentucky because he recognized that there was really no infrastructure for churches and church buildings. And so he began to hold outdoor camp meetings where there would be preaching and there would be music and there would be other vestiges of a normal worship service. And this was simply a way to reach people who had no other access to a traditional church. So Ian Murray then says, at the communion services held at Gasper River in July 1800, this is these camp meetings in Kentucky, McGreedy made it known beforehand that visitors should come prepared to camp on the ground. Attendance at these services was unprecedented. 
some traveling distances of 40 or even 100 miles, and the communion season became the camp meeting. These occasions quickly multiplied and becoming interdenominational in character were later called general camp meetings. So we're starting to have camp meetings then where people are coming and they're coming to hear preaching and to participate in really the traditional aspects of a normal worship service, but outside, outdoors, in a place where there are no conventional churches nearby. These camp meetings are on the one hand a impetus and a catalyst for great revival and yet at the same time they also become a catalyst for all sorts of doctrinal error, for theological and spiritual abuses, and for emotional and hysterical excess. And so while on the one hand the camp meetings are good because they provide church for people who don't have access to a conventional church, on the other hand, the camp meetings become a problem because the restraints that people feel inside of a conventional church building are no longer felt when you're outside at these massive camp meetings. So Ian Murray says this, of the physical phenomena attending the revival, and that's in these camp meetings, that of falling, quote-unquote, became the most common. People dropped as if shot dead, and they might lie unable to rise, conscious or unconscious, for an hour or for much longer. Some fell who had previously been skeptical of everything. Many, 150, 250, even 800, were recorded as falling during camp meetings. The potential for disorder increased when the numbers assembling necessitated open-air gatherings and these outdoor camp meetings. In the First Great Awakening, maybe this is something that should be charted out. In the First Great Awakening, we have... um, We have preaching. So this is the preacher. And uh, the preaching affects the audience. And the audience is responds with emotion to the preaching. And uh, sometimes this emotion included being so caught up and so convicted by the weight of guilt. I mean, we read just a little bit of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That kind of preaching is going to produce conviction, especially in the hearts of people who know that they're hypocrites. And as a result, there's going to be this emotional response. And yet... The preachers of the fruit of the first great awakening said that really the ultimate fruit is seen in a changed life. So this is the first great awakening. So there's preaching, it produces emotion, and that emotion is no indication one way or the uh, one way or another whether or not true conversion has actually taken place because the fruit of true conversion is seen in a changed life. And we see that even in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul talks about the worldly sorrow that doesn't make a difference in a person's behavior and a godly sorrow which leads to repentance. That's the first great awakening. So what the first great awakening preachers were really looking for was this. In the second Great Awakening, we have a little bit of a change. So we still have our preachers preaching. But emotion and emotional responses come to be seen as the very fruit of what marks conversion. which leads to a form of decisionism because if you can make 
if you can manipulate people's emotions and by so manipulating their emotions get them to make a decision in the moment if you count that then as conversion you can start to see how then this shift takes place in the second great awakening the emotional responses of the first great awakening were nothing more than or at least for the most part legitimate reactions to feeling convicted and responding emotionally to that conviction but over time people begin to see those emotional responses as something spiritual as something as some sign or some evidence of um, <clears throat> of a work of the Holy Spirit in a more profound sense, I suppose. And as a result of that, they begin to actually see the emotions themselves as the fruit, rather than seeing a changed life as the fruit with the emotions as nothing more than a inconsequential byproduct. And as a result, then you start to have people uh, responding emotionally you can see from what we just read from Ian Murray that fainting under the preaching that whole idea of falling down under the power of what was being preached and taught it's during the second great awakening that people start to see that as ooh, that's a sign of spirituality well eventually where does that going to show up in modern times that shows up in being slain in the spirit where does Pentecostalism get its idea of being slain in the spirit it comes from the second great awakening does not come from anywhere in the Bible, um, but you already knew that. So <clears throat> it's the idea that this is this emotional response is the fruit of someone who is being affected by the Holy Spirit, rather than saying, no, it's actually a transformed life that is the fruit. The emotional response is not a sign one way or the other whether or not true conversion has taken place. Yeah, Cameron. Uh, would it be you, you contrasted the um the differences of the two awakenings in their how they assess um, emotion would it be also fair to say that um, from how they evaluate, so they've got one way, they've got a difference in how they evaluate conversion. Would you say also that there's a difference in how they evaluated preaching in that at the second awakening, your preaching was evaluated based upon the response of the audience? Well, absolutely, and that's, that's where this is all going, is once you redefine conversion in terms of a momentary decision, and, and honestly, a lot of it even goes back to uh, the Calvinism-Arminianism divide as, as Methodists begin to really take over these camp meetings, and that's what happens as we go through here is that the Methodist movement in particular adopts the camp meeting model and uh, the Presbyterians when they start to see all of these excesses and things taking place in these camp meetings even though they were the first to utilize these camp meetings because they were so effective when they start to see these excesses they begin to kind of withdraw from all of this and it's mostly the Baptists and the Methodists who adopt these methods and the reason they adopt them is because they are so effective in reaching so many people the Baptist movement though of course the original American Baptists were Calvinistic Baptists the Baptist movement becomes more and more Arminian during this time period the Methodist movement already is Arminian that Arminian preaching Arminianism has at its foundation the idea that uh, salvation is ultimately a matter of human choice. Well, if you adopt that as your model, well, then that means that you as a preacher have as your goal the, the end objective of convincing the sinner to make the right choice. So if the human, if they, if the human um, audience has the ability to choose then it's really the onus is on the preacher to convince the human audience to make the right choice. So preaching now changes from just preaching the truth and trusting God with the results to now preaching a message that puts the listener in a position in which the listener is really coerced and manipulated and uh, strong-armed into making the right decision. 
because the Arminian approach to evangelism says that it's their decision to make. So if you can, if you can convince them, even trick them and manipulate them any way you have to do it into making the right choice, then you've done your job as an evangelist. So you're right, there is a change in the way that even preaching uh, begins to take place. It becomes much more, uh, <clears throat> much more coercive and manipulative. And uh, then you start to have the introduction of certain means and measures by which people are manipulated. So the altar call is introduced. This is where the altar call begins. A lot of Baptists think that the altar call goes all the way back to the New Testament, but it doesn't. It goes back to the Second Great Awakening. Why? Because if you, people started to find out that if you bring a whole bunch of people together and you keep them together for several days, and you do a lot of singing, and you get their emotions amped up, and then you have this dramatic call to salvation with a, with a response, a visible response, like standing up, raising your hand, coming down to the front. You get a lot more decisions that way. And so by redefining conversion as a decision, people began to really evaluate their success as an evangelist based on how many decisions were made at a certain revival. So preaching was decision-oriented because the Arminian approach to evangelism is decision-oriented. <clears throat> well, in many ways, I think that John Wesley's incorporation of an Arminian soteriology alongside of an evangelical gospel is perhaps the birthplace of pragmatism because I think Arminianism by default is pragmatic. It forces pragmatism because as soon as you make the gospel, as soon as you make a response to the gospel completely and totally dependent on the human listener, uh, it immediately opens the door to pragmatism. I think. But yes, in terms of, in terms of, expressions of pragmatism. The second half of the Second Great Awakening is where pragmatism opened, um, really opened up on the American church. Along with excesses, the Methodist emphasis on human free will began to convince many evangelists of their need to convince and persuade the audience using whatever means were deemed necessary. So Methodists continue to use the camp meeting model even after other denominations, especially the Presbyterians, found it no longer necessary. So Ian Murray says, The Methodists, harnessing as they thought a lesson from Kentucky, came to believe that the organization of mass meetings was a very effective part of evangelism. Emotion engendered by numbers and mass singing repeated over several days was conducive to securing a response. Results could thus be multiplied and even guaranteed. So if you bring a lot of people together and you get them singing a lot of songs and you get emotions heightened, that group dynamic along with that emotional uh, atmosphere, you can get people to make any decision you want them to make. And in this case, the ends justify the means. So as long as they're making a decision to believe in Jesus, then we'll use whatever means we have to use to manipulate them to make that decision. All right, the revivalism then of the Methodist camp meetings would be taken to a new level several years later under the ministry of a guy named Charles Finney. Uh, Finney was a Presbyterian but he was <clears throat> an Arminian Presbyterian, which was kind of a new thing at that point, who adopted <clears throat> really the New Haven theology of a guy named Nathaniel Taylor. And Charles Finney redefined, he redefined conversion, redefined repentance, and then adopted the new measures of the Methodist camp meetings and applied them in his own New England congregations. And so Finney then gained a reputation as an effective evangelist, 
And yet other Presbyterian ministers in New England were very wary of him because of the new measures that he began to promote. So some of those other <coughs> evangelists would be Edward Dorr Griffin, Asahel Nettleton, Lyman Beecher, who eventually joins Finney, Edward Payson, and Gardner Spring. And these men, unlike Finney, recognize that revival is not something that men can plan or command as they will. The revivals in the Northeast, which occurred over a period of 30 years, followed no pattern or sequence. Finney, on the other hand, believed that revival was something you could plan and was something that you could orchestrate and manipulate. So Nettleton says this about Finney, those ministers and Christians who have heretofore been most and longest acquainted with revivals are most alarmed. It was through the avoidance of such techniques as Finney advocated that the character of revivals for 30 years past has been guarded. If the evil be not soon prevented, a generation will arise inheriting all the obliquities of their leaders, not knowing that a revival ever did or can exist without all those evils. That's a reference to all the ways in which Finney attempted to manipulate revival. How did he do this? He did this through what he called his new measures. So the new measures were defended by Finney as part of the essence of Revival. What were these new measures? The next quote down. The encouragement of a physical response to preaching, such as falling to the floor. So, you know, get into it. Get physical. Women speaking in worship. Meetings carried on through long hours and on successive days. These were known as protracted meetings. And above all, inviting individuals to submit to God and to prove it by a humbling action, such as standing up, kneeling down, or coming forward to the anxious seat or the anxious bench, all came straight from the procedures that some Methodists had been popularizing for a quarter of a century. The anxious seat was only the altar call and the mourner's bench under another name. So Finney used all these techniques to hype up people's emotions and to call them to a response in the moment to make a decision while they are emotionally hyped and... In that moment, he was able to produce way more decisions than anybody else. And based on those decisions, he then claimed to be a great evangelist. Yep. With his uh, subordination or his association with the Presbyterian denomination, was he dishonest in that? Um, as far as, like, did he... Um, did he say he believed what they believed and then just kind of go off on a tangent once he was ordained, kind of give them credibility? Well, there were some shifts taking place in New England Presbyterianism at this time. A guy at Yale named Nathaniel Taylor was beginning to redefine Calvinism in order to make it more acceptable. He was actually making an Arminian form of Calvinism, as funny as that sounds. And we'll talk more about New Haven theology and Nathaniel Taylor. But Finney adopted that form of Calvinism. So, yeah, I think he was kind of... Uh, well, I don't think he really believed what the Presbyterian church taught. But it was a form of Presbyterianism that was becoming more popular at that time in New England. Now, I just want to... I'll, I'll leave you guys with this because we've got to end. But <clears throat> I just want you to see this. Whereas Calvinists up to this point would have preached and taught that... Y in order to be saved, you must cry out to God and ask Him to give you a new heart. That's what regeneration is. That's what conversion is. So you want to be saved, there's nothing you can do except plead for mercy and ask God to give you a new heart. What's Finney's version of conversion? Finney, taking an, Ar an Arminian position to its logical end, taking the new measures of the Methodist camp meeting revivals and these kinds of things and employing all of it, what is his gospel message? It is make yourselves a new heart. That's actually the title of his message. So he says, I will show you what is intended in the command of the text. It is that a man should change the governing purpose of his life. That for Finney was all that repentance is. So repentance is not a complete transformation of your whole person, a gift of God, a result of regeneration. It is instead a momentary decision whereby you decide that you are going to change 
what you're about. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a Christian now. And as long as a person makes that momentary decision, that in Finney's mind counted as conversion. It is that a man should change the governing purpose of his life. A man resolves to be a lawyer, then he directs all his plans and efforts to that object, and that for that time is his governing purpose. He directs all his efforts to that object and so has changed his heart. It is apparent that the change now described, affected by the simple volition of the sinner's mind through the influence of motives, is a sufficient change, all that the Bible requires. It is all that is necessary to make a sinner a Christian. So in the same way that you decided you wanted to come to seminary, or you decided that you wanted to be a pastor, that's, that's all that it means to be a Christian. And if I, can, if I can convince you to become a lawyer, then I can convince you to become a Christian. And if I have to use emotionally manipulative techniques to do that, then that's fine because the end justifies the means. So this is the shift that is taking place in the Second Great Awakening, and it's the shift that explains so much of what currently goes on in American evangelicalism when it comes to the way in which people are manipulated into making a decision for the gospel. And then, of course... You know, five, ten years down the road, you ask, well, what's the fruit of their life? And there is no fruit. And um, <clears throat> we'll talk about this more on Thursday. But the outcome of Finney's ministry in New England is that New England, even till today, is known as the Burnt Over District. The reason that New England is so dead to the gospel is because people got sick and tired of a door-to-door -door salesman technique form of gospel preaching, which was not a true expression of evangelism anyway. So the net result was that Finney got a lot of initial converts, and then most of those people fell away, and New England today is known as the burnt-over district. Thanks to Charles Finney.